firstborn of everything from humans to cattle, the animals and everything are all dying who were not in a home that was covered by the blood of the Lamb. During the Pesach meal, it is a practice to, to have bitter herbs with like horseradish or whatever as a representation of that bitterness. Okay? So I just want to clarify that. It's not a commandment to eat bitter herbs. It's not what the Hebrew text says. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roast it in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. Why? Does anybody know why? I know you know, Tom. I'll let you answer in a minute. Nobody else. Does anybody know why? Kimmy? I think it's because it be roasted in fire. It's a sacrifice. It's what? It's a sacrifice. Yeah, that's part of it. There's Exactly. That's exactly it. it. Anybody not hear Gary? You want to say it louder? It's a representation of Yeshua since there was no bone and he broken in his body. He was only ears were supposed to be. Right. Amen. Alright, verse 10. You shall let none of it remain until morning. And what remains of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. So, this isn't a thing that, to keep leftovers and make sandwiches for work. It's not what this is. is. This is a holy thing. This is a coveted, covenant thing. You understand? This, this is a special, unique meal. It is the most special, the most valuable meal out of the entire year, every year. That's how precious this meal is. You can treat it Look at it, whatever it is that make it trigger that in your heart. You need to understand this is not a meal of just eating a meal so my belly can be full. This is a meal that leads to my salvation. It points to my salvation. Let me put it that way. Eating the meal does not save you. Okay, for those who are going to about to email me that. And thus you shall eat it with a bell on your waist, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is Yahweh's Pesach. Now one thing I want to clarify real quick. There are some who uh, during Pesach will wear their outfit, whatever, or sandals on their feet and a stick in their hand or staff in their hand to do Passover to represent that haste. Well, nothing wrong with that. That's what you want to do. That's fine. I was not telling anybody you have to. The problem is also though is that any other Passover description that talks about keeping Passover never ever repeats this one part that I have ever seen. If anybody knows that it does, then let me know and I will make the correction. But that I have seen in my research and studies of Passover, because people say that we are to do this every year, eat it in haste and run out the building kind of thing. That's not, Scripture doesn't say that. They were being delivered out of Israel that very next morning. They were going to be ran out the door. And so Yahweh was telling them to get ready to go. This is why the bread was unleavened. And we'll get into that later. Uh, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am Yahweh. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on, on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. The plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial. You shall keep it as a feast to Yahweh throughout your, gener throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast for an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven excuse me, from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation for you, which we will have, because this year, first day of unleavened bread falls on a Shabbat. Um, and we'll, we'll actually be entering into Shabbat 
Friday night of Passover. So we will be having a holy convocation as uh, we enter into the first day of unleavened bread. All right. And then on the following Friday evening, we will have a holy convocation to come here and close out the Feast of Unleavened Bread right before sundown, and we enter into that next Shabbat. All right? Um, on that first day, there should be a holy convocation. On the seventh day, there should be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which is that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared for you. Now this, on a side note, should be a clear a clarification about the Sabbath. Unfortunately, many Messianic believe that it's okay to cook on the Sabbath. It's not okay to cook on the Sabbath. The scripture says, boil what you will boil, bake what you will bake on the sixth day. And so much so that on all the high holy days, you're to do nothing. No work, no cooking, no nothing. But here, the one and only feast, Yahweh tells us on the Feast of Unleavened Bread that on the first day and the seventh day is the only high Sabbath that you can cook that day for that day. And only for your household. So you can make the unleavened bread on that day for your household. But it is food that is to be eaten that day. It is not to be left over unto the next day. It is specifically, you are given permission by Yah to do that for those two days. Does everybody understand that? Amen? Amen. Amen. Y'all falling asleep on me? <laughs> Amen. So you shall observe, verse uh, uh, 17. So you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, for on this same day I will have I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt, therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month of the fourteenth day of the month, that evening you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses. Since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native in the land of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened in all of your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moshe called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick out and take lambs for yourselves according to your families. Kill the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For Yahweh will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood um, of the of the man, I can't even read this of the lintel and on the two doorposts, Yahweh will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your house to strike you. And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons along. The word along there means for all eternity, a time without end. It will come to pass when you come to the land which Yahweh will give you, just as He promised that you shall keep this service. And it shall be when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service? That you shall say, It is the Pesach sacrifice of Yahweh, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when He instructed the Egyptians and delivered, I'm sorry, when He struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. So the people bowed their heads in worship. Then the children of Israel went away and did so, just as Yahweh had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Alright, let's go to Exodus 34. Exodus 34, verse 25. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven, nor shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left until morning. Now here's something I want to explain. We see a com communion that is kept in the church. It's always with leavened crackers. Little wafer crackers. They're leavened. It, this is exactly what you're not supposed to do. And here's the other thing I, I want to clear up and I'll get into it more in a minute. Do not mistake the Last Supper as being Passover. They are not the same thing. 
The Last Supper is not the Passover meal. And I'll get to that in a minute. Let's go to Numbers chapter 9. If you got any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Not you. Go ahead. Um, could you clarify again for me uh, what you were saying earlier about you know how um, some teachers try to say that you have to wear sandals or you have to um, eat it in For the face off? Yeah, because I mean it, it says it says in verse fourteen. Exodus yeah, 12. Exodus 12. Uh, keep it as a feast to Yahweh throughout your generation. So keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. And then we read it again, I think in verse 24. And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. Um, so I guess just uh, Well, nowhere else in. I don't know if you're in here, but nowhere else in Scripture, when it talks about the Pesach, it does not give any reference about with the sandals on your feet and staff in the hand ready to go. That this situation was a situation at that that moment. They were they were being as soon as this happened that next morning they were being ran out, ran out of town. Pharaoh, because Pharaoh's like, get out, take your stuff, get out. Now we. We can, if you want to have the staff in your hand and have the sandals on your feet as a representation or a remembrance of what happened, that's fine. But we also need to understand that we are not celebrating Passover because we were delivered out of Egypt anymore. We're celebrating Passover because Yeshua came and died for us to restore the bride back unto the back unto the Father. So this is this is not. In haste, this is a remembrance. What about the lamb part? Then? That? To sacrifice the lamb? Well, that's a good question. The simplest way to answer that is this: We are not required to eat lamb on Passover because, for one, we cannot eat do it the way Scripture says to do it. We cannot prepare the Passover lamb the way it says to. Because I would dare say every single one of us in here, unless one of you's got a farm, none of us here are able to farm sheep or lambs or goats. And that makes sure that one is born without blemish and, and follow everything. Not to mention we do not have the Levitical priests. Not to mention we do not have the temple or anything else that partakes in all this. Because three times a year, we're supposed to go out to Jerusalem to the Temple of Yah for three feasts a year. Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. We can't do that. There's no temple there. Alright? If there was a temple there, and it was being read in accordance to Yeshua, then yes, we would be required to go up. And Yah would provide a way. Well, that's talking about the men, though. The men are supposed to go up. So, but... Some people will eat the lamb. Some people won't. We, we are not required, even according to what this is saying, we are not required to eat the lamb as a part of the Passover because we cannot prepare it the correct way according to the Passover. Does that make sense? Does anybody disagree with that? I, 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 I'm watching your face, Tom. Go ahead. Well, there's some things we can't keep right because there's things missing that we don't have. You know, we don't, we can't do. Um, all right, let me let me put it to you like this: Does everybody believe? Does anybody? Let me put it this way: Does anybody believe that because Yeshua came and died on the cross and rose from the dead by the power of Yah, that all sacrifice and offerings have been done away with? Does anybody believe that? You believe that, Brenda? not true. They are not all obsolete. When Yeshua returns, it says in Zechariah 14, verses 16 through 21, and it says in 
Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48 that the sacrifice and offerings will be reinstated. The sacrifice for sin unto death that has been completed by Messiah. But it even talks about that the prince who will go for Yahweh, he will go and make a sacrifice for the sin offering, for unintentional or accidental sin, and for the offerings like incense offerings and stuff like that, will be done before our King Messiah during his millennial reign. They are not obsolete. Yeah. The, the temple remained. That's why a lot of people think the temple remained 40 years after Yeshua's death. After Yeshua's death. A lot of people think, oh yeah, they just they just put sacrifice. Right? Yeah, they no. Sacrifice after Yeshua died because that the Holy of Holies was granted to Right. But that's not the case. They continue. Yep. 40, 40 years. Yeah. How funny. 40 years, too. Huh? Yeah. That's not a coincidence. It's not. Is that answer your question? Yeah. Oh. What? What was the original question? His original question was about the sandals on the feet and the staff in the hand. And then... Are we required to roast the lamb and stuff? Now let me put it to you like this. If I had the means to raise, to have a lamb or a goat unblemished first year in its male, and I could roast it according to scripture, I would do it. I would do it. But we don't have the means. That's why when Yeshua gets back, everything's going to be fixed and put back into place. So, with what we are able to do, we have the Passover meal together in celebration. Whether it be lamb or chicken or beef or whatever, we have that. Now, Michelle and I, every year, we have a lamb. Just to have that representation. And we'll have lamb again this year. So, but, if, if we want to really get nitpicky, that lamb doesn't truly represent you because it's chopped up. It's just, and so we can only use it as a representation. We cannot declare it to be a Passover lamb in that sense. Does that make sense? Some things are hot, our hands are tied behind our back on, and we just make the best of it that we can do to honor Yahweh. But if I had the capability, I would be roasting one the way it says to. Does that answer the question? You be quiet now. No, I'm kidding. Don't be quiet. I like the questions. Plus, it gives everybody else, somebody else, who may not want to speak out now. Uh, numbers 9, did your question, did you ask, ask a question, Laura? No, I was just trying to understand what His question, okay. About. Okay. You got anything to say, Tom? Well, I, I think... See that wheels turning from here. Okay. Well, you have that point. You have that comment. Like, do we have to go to like? Is it a requirement to go to Jerusalem? And I, I there's a verse in the Ten Commandments. So it's Exodus 20, 19, 20. And 20. he says, "Wherever I choose to record my name," he talks about you know the instructions for building altar before Jerusalem it was Shiloh. Remember. That was still in Israel. It was still in Israel, yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering, so here we are thousands of miles away. What, and also, you hear stories about the priests that became so corrupt. They, they, you know, of, of people that, you know, not going up to Jesus because of the reason they became so corrupt. So I'm not so sure that, you know, it's, it's a sin. Well, yeah, but Yah does say three times a year you will come up to Jerusalem and keep this, specifically to the men. So, I mean, he still says it. So, I mean, if, if the temple was there and it was being ran in accordance to I mean, Yeshua being the high priest, then I, I honestly believe it. 
and this is my opinion, I'll say this is my opinion, I honestly believe that we would be required to go up to man. Yeah, then I believe, yeah, yeah. But he would be keeping it. You know what I mean? I don't yeah. think there'd be any corruption. Yeah, and I agree. Yeah, I agree. I agree. If he was running it. Yeah, amen. All right, where are we at? Okay, now, this, this year caused some confusion. Because as some may know, especially those on Facebook know that last month, the end of March, people kept the Passover. Alright? And so I was getting hammered with people asking me, what's going on? Why is why are you why are we keeping Passover at the end of April and why are these people keeping Passover at the end of March? Well, here's the thing. One, the simplest answer, which is super short, is astronomical spring starts at the end of March. This year it started on March 21st. Okay? Now, Genesis chapter 1 says, I give you the planets and the stars, uh, the moon and the stars, to give you the times and the seasons for the Mulligan. Okay? For the beginning of months, and to, so that we know when to keep the feast. Okay? So with that said, astronomical spring. From the alignment of the planets and everything else of what has to fall into place to bring in the entrance of spring. At the day of the entrance of spring, that following new moon becomes the first month of a bee. That is the simple short answer at all. You want something a little more deeper or detailed, go Google it up and figure it out yourself because I ain't got the answer. But that is it. That is it. It is that simple. So these people, and what these people don't understand, is if they stay according to what they were keeping last month, their Passover in two years is going to fall like at the end of February or something. It's not going to work. Astronomical spring, starting March 21st. Whenever that starts, that next new moon gives you the month of a bee. Because of that, every few years, we have what is called a Dar 2. It is a 13th month added to the biblical calendar, so to speak. Now, you will not find a Dar 2 in Scripture. This is just how, this is what they call it, to balance things out so everything stays in cycle. What is the common, what is a year? What's a full year? That's your question. 365. Okay, 12 months, that's what I was looking for. Okay. got all really technical on me. 365 days, <laughs> point two, point... No, I'm just kidding. No, but... No, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, 365 days on our calendar. Biblical calendar is actually 360 days. Because if a moon cycle goes from new moon to, to, to the end of the cycle, from when you see the siding of the sliver to the end of the cycle where it disappears is 29 30 days on the average 29 point something blah 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 okay so we technically it comes in almost never do you have a 31 day thing um so with that said what was my point um nowhere in scripture does it say that there are only 12 months in the biblical calendar we assume there is because that's what our culture and what every other culture has 12 months in a calendar but scripture doesn't say that. It references a 12th month, but it doesn't say, Yah never says, you will have 12 months in a year. It doesn't say that. So if that's how you've always based it, you need to erase that out of your mind. Because the Bible does not teach of a 12 month year at all. No way. Okay? Did that make my point? Yeah, and not only that. Yeah, you'd be at the end of summer, beginning of September. So, yeah. So, all right. Um, so my point to that was just to understand why some had Pesach last month and some ha and some are doing it this month. So, um, and to bring up, and that's leading up to this second Passover. Some have called it for this. Now Yahweh spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Let the children of Israel keep the Passover at its appointed time. 
on the 14th death month, day of this month at twilight, you shall keep it uh, at its appointed time according to all its rites and ceremonies you shall keep it. So Moses told the children of Israel that they should keep the Pesach. And they kept the Pesach on the 14th day of the first month at twilight in the wilderness of Sinai according to all that Yahweh com commanded Moshe, so the children of Israel did. Now there were certain men who were defiled by a human corpse so that they could not keep the Passover on that day and they came before Mer um, came before Moses and Aaron that day and then I'm sorry and those men said we came to file uh, we become defiled by human corpse why are we kept from presenting the offering of Yahweh at its appointed time among the children of Israel one quick thing do you understand the importance that Yah is putting on this Passover if, even touching a dead body he would not allow anybody to bring their offerings up to Yah for that Passover because, because what is the commandment in Torah according uh, concerning a dead body? You're unclean. How many days does it take to be clean? Seven. Seven. So if I touch a dead body today, I go and wash my clothing, I wash myself, and I sun down for seven days, and after seven days I shall be clean. It's the same with Nadah. Nadah is the same way for Passover as well. But... I'm not going to get into all that right now. And those who don't know what the Dao is, it's a woman's monthly cycle. Then um, Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If any one of you or your posterity, meaning your children, is unclean because of a corpse, or it is far away on an, or is far away on a journey, he may still keep Yahweh's Passover. Wait a minute. How? On the 14th day of the second month, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall leave none of it until morning, nor break one of its bones. According to all the ordinances of the Passover, they shall keep it. But the man who is clean and is not on a journey and ceases to keep the Passover, that same person shall be cut off from among his people because he did not bring the offering of Yahweh at its appointed time that man shall bear his sin. And if a stranger dwells among you and would keep the Pesach of Yahweh, he must do so according to the rite of the Pesach, according to its ceremony, you shall have one ordinance, both for the stranger and the native of Israel. All right, let's go to Deuteronomy 16. Any questions? Now, if you've got questions, throw it up there. Stranger or foreigner, what is it that is that? Does it believe her? What? Stranger, someone who's not uh, blood-born Israel, a foreigner, or a going. What? You have the same. You have the same laws before dress for the citizen. Now, what is that in relation to the taking of the Passover? Or, no. I still can't hear. I'm sorry, Elizabeth. What's she saying? Exactly. Yeah, yes. If they're willing to be obedient to it, then, that, then it applies to them. They're to keep it exactly the same way as Israel's to keep it. I mean, if they were circumcised, huh? If they were circumcised, they could keep the Passover. Right. The men, yes. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. They basically, in a simpler way to say it, they are fully converted to Yah. Yep. Yeah. All right. You have, did you want to ask a question? Sir, does that mean women on the Uh They're unclean, but I that one. I would read into it and, and pray about it, you know, make sure. Because I know if you're unclean, oh, no, 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 not in a dog. I'm sorry, not in a dog. When a woman has a child. Yeah, yeah, man, I have to go back and look that one up. I, I, I used to know that one. I haven't studied that part out in a while because nobody's asked me that one in a while. 
So yeah, that'd be a good one to study out and find out. So, but if you end up keeping it the second month, then you do it with your family at home. All right, all right. Deuteronomy 16, one through eight. Is it, it's a Passover review. Observe the month of Abib. Keep the Passover of Yahweh your Elohim. For in the month of Abib, Yahweh your Elohim brought you out of Egypt by night. Therefore you shall sacrifice the Passover to Yahweh your El from the flock of the herd in the place where God chooses to put his name. You shall not eat no leavened bread with it. Or you shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread with all that is the bread of affliction for you came out of the land of Egypt in haste that you may remember the day in which you came out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life no leaven shall be seen among you in all your territory for seven days nor shall and the unleavened bread is the representation of that haste okay the staff and sandal and ready to run out the door that's what that that's why the bread was unleavened um Verse 5, you may not sacrifice the Pesach within any of your gates which Yahweh your El gives you, but at the place where Yahweh your El chooses to make his name abide, there you shall sacrifice Passover at twilight, at the going down of the sun, at the time you came out of Egypt. You shall roast and eat it in the place which Yahweh chooses, and in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. Six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a sacred assembly to Yahweh your Elohim shall do no work on it. Now when you look at that verse, verse 7, and you shall roast and eat in the place where Yahweh chooses, and in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. Passover is an all night thing. Passover is all nighter. Who wants to spend the night? That's totally awesome. I didn't think I, I thought I might get one hand up. Maybe we will. Maybe we'll just stay here all night. My wife's gone. Oh my God! <laughs> what are you doing to me? <laughs> hey, well, this Passover is falling on a Friday night. Everybody just bring a pillow and a sleep bag. We'll crash out right here in the sanctuary, get up, and have spot service. Yeah, we'll have to discuss that. I'm all for it. Anybody snores, better bring some plugs. I, no, I am, uh-uh. <laughs> All right, 2 Kings. 2 Kings. I snore, so y'all better bring your plugs. <laughs> All right. 2 Kings 23, 21 through 23. Then the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover to Yahweh Elohim as it is written in the book of the covenant. Such a Passover surely had never been held since the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was held before Yahweh in Jerusalem. Second Chronicles 30, 1-5. And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of Yahweh of Jerusalem to keep the Passover to Yahweh Elohim of Israel. For the king and his leaders and all the assembly of Jerusalem had agreed to keep the Passover in the second month. For they could not keep it at the regular time because a sufficient number of priests had not consecrated themselves, nor had the people gathered together Jerusalem. That is another reason why we cannot go into Jerusalem to keep Pesach. Because there are no priests to be sanctified to help present the Passover lamb. That's why. I, I can't remember what the reason was. Now I remember. Every well, five verses. Um, Verse 4, and, and the matter pleased the king and all the assembly, so they resolved to make a proclamation throughout all the land from Beersheba to Dan that they should come to keep the Passover to Yahweh Elohim of Israel at Jerusalem, since they had not done it for a long time in the prescribed manner. All right, Ezekiel 45. Now understand something. Ezekiel 
chapters 40 through 48, those nine chapters all pertain to millennial reign. It is the, Ezekiel, it is the description of the building of the Ezekiel temple, which Yeshua will rule and reign from, and then everything that follows to the end of chapter 48. Just want to clarify that real quick. So this is a proclamation or a description of what will be when we are with Yeshua in the millennial reign and those who are still in the flesh. Ezekiel 45, verses 21 through 24. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, you shall observe the Pesach, a feast of seven days. Unleavened bread shall be eaten, and on that day the prince shall prepare for himself and for all the people of the land a bull for a sin offering. On the seven days of the feast he shall prepare a burnt offering to Yahweh, seven bulls and seven rams without blemish daily for seven days, and a kid of the goats daily for a sin offering. One more. And he shall prepare a grain offering of one ephah for each bull and one ephah for each ram, together with a hint of oil for each ephah. And then... Uh, now Zechariah, let's go to Zechariah 9. Zechariah coincides. Let's see. Okay. Now there are some. Hang on a second. Let me read this real quick. Zechariah coincides with Mark chapter 12, 12 through 19. I'm going to read that real quick. Mark chapter 12, 12 through 19. And they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them, so they left him and went away. Then they sent him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. When they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one, for you do not regard the person of man, but teach the way. Am I the right one? Oh, I'm sorry, John 12. Sorry, my bad. I knew that didn't sound right when I was reading that. John 12. I have that up there, 12 through 19. Okay, let's try this again. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Yeshua was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees, and palm trees is one of the branches you're supposed to put on the sukkah for Sukkot, by the way. Uh, took branches of palm trees, went out to meet him, and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh, the King of Israel. Ooh, hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> then Yeshua, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's foal, or colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Yeshua was glorified, then they remembered that they think that these things were written about him, that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Zechariah chapter 9 coincides with that. It says... 9, 9, 9, and 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout of daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. Now here's something to I want to point out. Now, if I remember right from my own reading, it doesn't say it in the in the Torah, but it says, or in the Hadashah, the New Testament, it says in the Torah that, that you are to, on the tenth day of the month of Abib, to go and get this lamb without blemish or goat and pick it out and set it aside to be prepared. Okay? Well, it is said that they call it Palm Sunday. Now, let's see. Yeshua died on Wednesday, four days after. So that makes Palm Sunday the day that Yeshua rode into Jerusalem 
on the donkey, and they all laid the branches before him. They picked out the lamb. Nice. For four days later for that lamb to be crucified. And they nice. didn't even know it. Well, I got goosebumps. <laughs> Good. Is that not amazing? That is good. That Everything is good. being fulfilled the way Scripture says. Nice. It says, on the tenth day, you shall pick out the lamb without blemish and set it aside. <laughs> on the tenth day, nice. Yeshua rode in to Jerusalem on a donkey that no man had touched and been on. And they laid down Hosanna, the king of Israel. Nice. Blessed is the Lamb. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and four days later, on Wednesday, he was crucified and died. What an amazing God we serve. <laughs> All right. Let's go to Matthew chapter 26. Little did we know when we were just in the regular church system on Sunday how important. Yeah, we were missing our, out on so much. We were missing out on so much. I mean, our Messiah just laid it all out. Kept Torah. I mean, you, you get something like, I never put that together. That just blows. Man, that is so good. Our God is so good. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> Matthew 26, verses 17 through 29. Now on the first day of of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Yeshua. Let me stop right there. So many people have had confusion. They're like, wait a minute. They're talking about coming together to have the, the Passover meal with Yeshua. But it's saying it's on the first day of Unleavened Bread. You need to understand the mindset of Israel. Israel always treated Passover Unleavened Bread as an eight-day event. And this is why they called it the first day. But it was... Because Passover in itself is not a day. At sundown, Thursday night on the 21st, we are not entering into Passover. It's not what it is. Passover is that single event at night, at twilight. We the, to, uh, sacrifice the Passover lamb and eat it. Okay? And then at that sundown, we enter into that first day of unleavened bread. But Jewish tradition or mentality mindset was... It was always looked at as an eight-day event. They rolled it all together as an eight-day event. So I just want that to be understood. Now, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Yeshua saying, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will, be, I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Yeshua had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now, this is called the Last Supper. They did not have the actual Pesach. Go ahead, David. So, um, it says at 18, does that teach you? Does, I mean, does that teach Teacher Yeshua. Yeah, but the man that they were going to ask, the teacher said, does he represent? The, the guy whose place that they're wanting to have it at? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. Do you know something I don't? No. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, let me hear it. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, it's just, I know a certain man. So, yeah, I, actually, I would I would agree with you. It's got to be, he's got to be somebody specific. He just doesn't tell us who he is. So the disciples did as Yeshua directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Verse 20, when evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say to him, Lord, it is, is it I? And he answered and said, He who dips his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written to him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. This is to all of those people who think that when, that hell is not real. Because I'm going to tell you something. If there is no lake of fire, like a lot of Christians and some Messianic um, sects teach, that when we die, 
if we are separated from Yah for eternity, that we stand before him on judgment day, he condemns us to not exist, is what they are basically telling us. Then you, there's no loss. I had a big discussion with a Jehovah's Witness one time. I had one of the elders of their church come to my house. They are one of the biggest offenders on this. And he sat there, and so I, I, I'm like, okay, what topic do you want to talk about? And he's like, there's no hell. And I said, okay, so we started going through Scripture, and he just, he flat out said, it's not what it means. And I said, okay, so the Bible says that we will be cast into the lake of fire, but it's not what it means. He goes, no, it's all metaphorical. And I'm like, okay, so then I win. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, if you're right, and according to what you teach, that when we die, if we die in our sin, we no longer exist. We are erased. Okay? And he's like, yeah. I said, then I win. And he's, again, he's like, well, what do you mean? I said, because if I die in Yah, then I go to heaven to be with Yah, I win. If I die in my sin and I cease to exist, I win. I, there's no loss. There's no punishment. There's no punishment. And he's like, well, before you cease to exist, you know you're going to be separated from Yah. I'm like, what do I care? I'm getting ready to disappear. I'm getting ready to cease to exist. I will never know that I ever existed because I will cease from existence. I win. So I can either choose to live for God or I can go be the biggest debauchery out there and sinful man in the world. Either way, I win. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. There's no, sac there's no, there's no loss. There's no uh, punishment. Right. Man, he got mad as a hatter, man. That boy's face got so red. And he, gray hair, red face. It was a funny combination. And as he's walking out the door, because he, he just couldn't argue with me, I said, I told him flat out, I said, you're a liar. I said, you preach a lie. I said, you are leading everybody in your church in the lie. And he had two of the women that kept coming to our neighborhood every, every Saturday they would show up. And we'd been talking to the women, my brother and I, my wife and his wife, been witnessing to them about this stuff. And as he's walking out the door, she goes, yeah, yeah, never saw another Jehovah's Witness in our neighborhood ever again. No, I'm just kidding. Oh. Uh, but, uh, Jeez. <laughs> don't let your husband watch this. Video. Oh, no. <laughs> no, but, um, um, so he, he stands at the door, he stands at the door, and he, go, he goes to shake my hand, and, and, he, and I said, no, I wouldn't shake his hand. And he goes, he goes, why won't you shake my hand? And I said, because 2 John verses 10 and 11 says, if anybody comes unto you with a doctrine other than this, do not, part, do not shake their hand in greeting, or you will partake in their sin. And do not let them into your house. I, I, did, I screwed up the last part. I let him in my house. I wasn't thinking. But I wouldn't shake his hand on the way out. Now, there are people like us who because of what we are living, some of us are married to a Catholic or Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or whatever. Scripture does say that if the believing wife or the believing husband, I'm sorry, if the non-believing wife or non-believing husband stays with the believing wife or the believing husband, then their blessing will roll over onto the non-believer. And, and I believe that they, there's hope for that non-believing spouse. And I'm going to say this boldly, and I'm not declaring this on anybody. Jehovah's Witness, Mormonism, Catholicism, and all these things. If you follow hardcore to those beliefs, you're not a believer when it comes to the Word of Yahweh. Okay? Am I making that clear? I am not declaring judgment on anybody. But what I am saying is if we are going to stick to the man-made doctrines, we are not a believer in the doctrine of Yah. And we need that change. We need that deliverance. I just want to make sure you weren't going to shoot me later. <laughs> like, what did you say? But, um, all right, so I just made that clear. Um, where am I at? I am. I was. Thank you. Then Judah was betrayed, uh, who was betrayed, betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, You have said it. And as they were eating, Yeshua took bread, blessed it, 
and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and, and gave thanks, gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the renewed covenant. That's the actual text from the, the uh, Greek Septuagint, which is shed for man for the emissions, remissions of sin. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now or until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I want to reiterate one more thing. This gives an indication of saying that they went and had the Passover meal with Yeshua. That's not correct. Because that means the next day when Yeshua was sacrificed, He was crucified on a tree. The Torah says it is a curse to be crucified on a tree. It would not be done on a high Sabbath. That next day would have been a high Sabbath. It would have been the first day of unleavened bread. Do you understand that? Not for that, but when he was crucified, was it at the same time that the rest of the priests were doing the lamb? Preparations, everything else, exactly. Amen. So, unfortunately in the English, it kind of is a little bit, a little bit misleading. Um, okay, Mark 14. Mark 14, 12 through 16. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, it's the same thing. The exact same thing as what we just read in Matthew. Um, see, John 11. John 11, 45 through 55. Some of the ones that repeat themselves, I'm just giving to you for extra witness to what is being said. John 11, 45 through 55. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Yeshua did believed in Him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Yeshua did. Then the chief priests said the Pharisees gathered, uh, and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do for this man who works many signs? If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. All the priests and Pharisees, all they cared about was their statue. And then one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. Listen to this. Nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. He knew the prophecy of the Tanakh. And he knew that Yeshua was that prophecy. Now this is he... Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Yeshua would die for the nation. And not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of Yah who were scattered abroad. It was a, that is a prophecy of what will come at Yeshua's second coming, when the two houses of Israel will come back together, be restored, and they will be one people, and he will be one Yah over them. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's see. I'm sorry. I missed one. John chapter 1, verse 29. I'm just going to read that. The next day, John saw Yeshua come toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of Yah who takes away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. John 13. Now, I encourage you to read. Well, actually, I'm going to read all this. All right, now before the Feast of the Passover, listen carefully. Before the Feast of the Passover, when Yeshua knew that His hour had come, that He should depart from this world to the Father, having loved His own, who were in the world, He loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot. Did you just catch what I just said? What did I just read in Matthew? Where should we go and prepare the Passover meal? And they go up into the upper room and they're eating together and like yada yada yada. Who is somebody's going to betray me? Who's going to betray me? The one who sticks his hand in the bowl of wheat. And Judah says, "Is it I?" And he said, "Yeshua said yes." But they made it seem like he was having a Passover meal with them. But right here it says, "Before the feast of Passover and supper, verse two, supper being ended, the devil had entered into Judas. Same event, right? Obviously." Verse 
23, Yeshua, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from Yah and was going to Yah, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Yahweh, or, or I'm sorry, Adon, are you washing my feet? Yeshua answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter, Kepha, said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Yeshua answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Adon, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Yeshua said to him, Don't be greedy. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him, therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what, what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Adon, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Adon, and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor who is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Alright. Now John chapters 18 and 19, due to time because I'm trying to get everything in and trying to honor the church's wishes that we're out of here by 6, which we probably will be late tonight. Read... Between now and Passover, read John chapters 8 and 18 and 19. And who here has seen the, the, passion of the, the Passion of the Christ? That, I don't know about anybody else, man, but that, man. I can't, I can't imagine watching that twice. Yeah, I have. <laughs> um, that is all based off of John 18 and 19, verbatim. Except for the few little filling pieces. But the things according to Scripture, Yeshua from the Garden of Gethsemane to his crucifixion is right out of John 18 and 19. I'm not saying go watch the movie, but I'm saying study these two chapters out between now and the case on. Well, I'm just. <laughs> Let me put it this way that movie was what, that was the final, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. We are visual people, you can read something and be like, wow. But man, when you see something, you know, I've been in the kind of neighborhoods, I've watched two guys standing right in front of me start stabbing each other. I was standing right there a few feet away watching them do it. And I knew both guys, but they hate each other. And they're just sticking each other. And that's going to have much more powerful effect on you than reading in the newspaper, two guys standing there stabbing each other. Well, this movie was that. Scripture says that Yeshua's bones were exposed from his beating. It says he was beaten so bad he was unrecognizable. Mel Gibson, Yah blessed him to do a great job on bringing the realism of Scripture to what happened to Yeshua. And when I saw that, and when they were beating him, I hadn't cried in over 15 years since I was a teenager because everything I went through made me so hard I, I didn't cry. I was 33 years old and I lost it. And 30 years of hate and rage and anger broke out of me right there in that movie theater and I fall like a baby. And the part when she was carrying his cross and it shows Miriam and she has a little flashback. She sees him fall. She has a flashback of Yeshua fallen as a child and she runs to scoop him up. And she runs to him and he looks at her and he says, I go to make things new. That was, that was it, man. I lost it. Because of what he went through to take us to make things new. What he endured 
There's not a single person on this planet that could have endured the beating, let alone carry the cross, and then be nailed on the cross. And then after all of that, he still said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It wasn't just that physical. He was taking on the sins of the world. What kind of weight was that? Oh, man. On top of the flogging, on top of carrying the cross, on top of everything. The spiritual and He the took physical. on all of our sin on himself. It was laid on him. Yeah. Yeah. I almost, I almost had the passion to play for, uh, for a service instead of doing the Passover teaching, but we got too many kids and not everybody would have been able to be in here. And those who may have seen it might have been like, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm going home. So, I didn't. Alright, 1 Corinthians 5. We're just about done with this one. The matzo and the first verse are shorter because there's not as much stuff about those. That's why I warned you all last week. It was going to be probably close to a couple hours teaching. And if you didn't hear me, I must not have said it very loud. I can't hear it at my part. That's all right. You need to be hearing you. All right, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, 8. Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Messiah, our Passover, was sanctified, sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the un excuse me, unleavened bread of sin, sincerity, and truth. Listen to me. That leaven, if there is any part of the old you that you hang on to, the crutches, cigarettes, whatever it is, it's part of the old man. I don't know what it is. I, I, I'm not going to guess anybody. And when we don't let go of that, then we keep that little piece of that leaven. And Scripture says that that little bit of leaven leavens the whole batch. This is why the body of Messiah struggles so much to be in the perfect will of the Father because we're not letting go of the old man. You've got to let go and become that full new man in Yeshua, renewed in His Spirit, in His flesh, in everything about Him. You have got to let that stuff go. That's why we keep coming back around to these same trials do these same temptations and stuff because there's this little piece of something that we're hanging on from the old you that keeps, it starts growing. It starts growing. Then we do something stupid and we go and we pray and we repent and we cry out to God because in our heart we really want to be right with Him. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so, it's, so He wipes that all the way and it's back down to that little tiny piece that you're still hanging on to. And it starts growing again and growing again. And then you keep going through this cycle until you finally flick that piece of unleavened or that leavened garbage out of your life. Get rid of it, whatever it is. Look, I'm going to tell you something. Secular music, worldly music, things that do not feed your spirit, stuff you watch on TV, all of that stuff, it's a part of it. I don't care if it seems cool. I don't care how innocent it seems. If it does not honor you on your walk, if it does not build you in your walk, let it go. That's right. yeah. Do you really have to hang on to it? 50 cent, he's only worth 50 cent. <laughs> he ain't worth the 20 bucks you spend on the CD. Who else could I think of? Uh, George Jones, country people, whatever. I don't know. I'm just trying to grab different genres. They've not worth hanging on to because 99% of what they sing, sex, adultery, beating up your friend, whose boots has your bed been under? As bad as your boots been under whatever it is. You know, whatever. You know what I'm saying. Let go. Let go for crying out loud. You do not need to watch that show. You do not need to, hey, look, I'm preaching to myself as much as anybody else. I want to make sure, man, this Passover means more to me than any Passover ever that I've kept before. 
And each year they should become more to us. Each year the feet should mean more to us than they did the year prior. Because that next year you should be closer to Yah than you were a year ago. Amen? Amen. Amen. Look, I like NCIS. Yeah. <laughs> I really like that show. But man, I'm not watching it no more. I'm not. I, I'm letting that go. But we're in season 10. What did you say, hallelujah? But we're in season 10. <laughs> no, we're not. Season 9. <laughs> so I can watch without you? Yes. Yeah. You know, but that's for me. I'm not, I can't make my family do it. And I'm not saying that watching TV is a sin. But, I mean, really, if you're watching something that every time you watch it, it's about somebody getting a bullet in the head or they're showing their guts or somebody's been raped or... Or whatever else. I mean, honestly, really, <coughs> is Yeshua sitting there watching it with you? I heard one no. Let's try that again. Is Yeshua sitting there watching it with you? No. No way. He does not partake in that stuff. I guarantee you, Yeshua, if he was here today, would not be going to see any movie. He would not be watching any of the garbage on TV. Do we really need to watch it? Do we really have to have it? I mean, Netflix, man. It's trouble. All right, enough of that. Oh, for Passover? I'll let you know. I'm not going to tell you right now. I have a reason for that. And you'll understand. And then will be like, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah. If, feet, yeah, at Pesach, if we should be washing the feet. Okay. So, and I'm going to, yeah. Okay. You'll know why later. I'm really hoping somebody would ask me. No. Um, all right, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Adon that which I also delivered to you, that the Adon Yeshua on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper. Okay, let me, let, me, let me say something real quick. This breaking of bread, the drinking of wine, is commonly called communion. Okay? All right, whatever. That's what you want to call it. Knock yourself out. The breaking of the um, of love, unloving bread. The breaking of the body of Messiah is taking the wine of the blood of Messiah. Okay. Now, it is commonly taught that Yeshua says, "When you do this often in remembrance of me." It does not say that. This is not something that I. And, and this is my personal opinion. I do not believe we're supposed to do this every week, like you see many churches do, and some congregations. Because I have been in a lot of churches that do it every week, and I'll sit there and I'll watch people because I won't partake in it. And I will watch the majority of the people in there, and they're all sitting there chit-chatting away while they're holding their little cracker and their little cup of juice. They're not even focused on what they're doing. They're, whole, they're off somewhere else. And then all of a sudden the pastor says, okay, now let us, and then all of a sudden they're like, okay. Oh, and they slam the drink and then right back to their conversation. They're not even showing the reverence of what it is that they're doing. And the, the, the other thing is, I guarantee, I, I, well, I can't guarantee, but I'd be willing to bet a million dollars that somebody in that congregation ain't right with Yah and they're taking of the communion. And then that's even more trouble on their head. It says, when you do this in remembrance of me, my wife and I believe very firmly and I'm not telling anybody else that they have to do what we're do, what we do in this. We do it once a year. We do it at Pesach. When, every, when we do this in remembrance. We do it at Pesach every year. That's when we do it. There has been once or twice in the, in the middle of the year that I actually felt led, believed I was being led by Yah to do the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the juice. Now, there will be juice, there will not be wine, because if we have anybody there who has battled alcohol in the past, I do not want to cause a temptation to my brother or sister. 
All right, verse 25, 26. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the renewed covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. There's the key. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim Yahweh's death till he comes. See, the thing is, is right there they say, do this often. That's not what he says. He says, as often as you do this. He's not saying that we are supposed to do this often. There's a difference between the two. And definitely every week. I don't agree with you, but that's my opinion. All right, last one. Hebrews 11.28. Hebrews 11, 28. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. What? Yeah. By faith, he kept the pass Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. I'm talking about Abraham. Or uh, Moses. All right. Matzo. Go to the next one. And you go to the scriptures. Exodus 12, 15 through 20 and verse 39 is the read is the reading of the of, of the unleavened bread. Alright, let's look at uh, Exodus 23, 15. shall keep the feast of unleavened bread, you shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib, for any you came out of Egypt, none shall appear before me empty. Leviticus 23, verses 6 and 8, for those who don't know the feast, Leviticus 23 gives you all seven feasts. It gives you a nutshell understanding breakdown of it. Six through eight. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to Yahweh. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. But you shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation. Excuse me. You shall do no customary work on it. Numbers twenty-eight. If you have any questions, say something. 28, 17 through 25. On the 15th day of this month is the feast of unleavened bread, shall be eaten for seven days. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no work. You shall present an offering made by fire as a burnt offering to Yahweh. Two young bulls, one ram, seven lambs in their first year. Be sure they are without blemish. Their grain offering shall be a fine flour mixed with oil. Three tenths of an ephah you shall offer for a bull and two tenths for a ram. You shall offer one tenth of an ephah for each of the seven lambs. Also one goat as a sin offering to make atonement for you. You shall offer these besides the burnt offering of the morning, which is for a regular burnt offering. In this manner you shall offer the food of the offering made by fire daily for seven days as a sweet aroma to Yahweh. It shall be offered beside the regular burnt offering and its drink offering. And on the seventh day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. Deuteronomy 16. shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread with it, and that is the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste. The bread of affliction is because it was not able to leaven. Right. Okay? They had to make the bread hastily. It, it was not able to have the time as those who ever made bread, you know, it takes a few hours for the 
the lump of bread to leaven up and swell up and stuff, and then you can cook it and make bread. They weren't able to do that. It would start slapping it and throw it on the hot stone and cook it up and all that. Yes? I, I kind of stumbled. I didn't, I was looking for something else, but I kind of stumbled on this. And it's it's the same word they use for humble when he says, I humbled you, you, you know, you thirsted, and, and I humbled you, and went through the wilderness, you know, thirst, and humbled you. That same, it's the same exact word, humble, is also the word he uses for affliction. And yes, that's, I forgot all about that, Tom. Thank you. That's exactly right. So we, we eat the unleavened bread for a week in humbleness. It is to, it is to help us realize, let me put it to you like this. Here's a good example. My wife and I, every year that we keep the feast, every year we go through the house, get rid of all, all the leaven. Every year we think we got it beat, we got it beat, and every year we find something a cracker in the couch or something, man. We missed something. And last year, I think it was last year, year before, man, Michelle, she went through that whole house with fine tooth comb. Even cops couldn't have done better than her. I mean, she just dissected that whole house. And she's like, I did it. I did it. Last, it was the second to last day of unleavened bread, and she found something. And it was right there, right behind something in the cupboard. She's in her purse. I went through every inch of this cover. There's no way right there. I thought it was in her purse. Is that where it was? Yeah, it was I in her purse. Kind of, all no. right, well, either way. She went through the whole kitchen. Nothing was in the kitchen or in the house anywhere, but it was in her purse. She, she didn't had, go through her purse. That's yeah, what it was. she had a pack of saltine crackers from Yeah. Her. So her it, it goes to show we cannot do this on our own. No matter how hard we try, to, to be perfect, we can't. We can't make this on our own. We need God. And Yah's the one that removes that loving, that sin out of our life. Amen? Amen. Alright. Let's see. Did I finish those verses? Verse 4. No leaven shall be seen among you in all of your territory seven days, nor shall any of the meat which you sacrifice the first day at twilight remain overnight till morning. You may not sacrifice the Passover with any of your gates, which Yahweh your El gives you. But at the place where Yahweh your El chooses to make his name abide, there you shall sacrifice Passover at twilight, at the going down of the sun, at the time you came out of Egypt. You shall roast and eat it in the place which Yahweh your El chooses, and in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. Six, there it is again. Six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day, there shall be a sacred assembly to Yahweh your Elohim. You shall do no work on it. We're going to really contemplate staying here all night. Those who are uh, yeah. What? So, if you do Shikar all night, or you still stay up all night, do they have to be ready to go, or do they have to sleep? Oh, no, we can go to sleep. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see you at the point. There ain't going to be no, nothing here to take showers, so make sure you smell really good before you get here. Hopefully it'll last you all night. Or bring your deodorant with you. Huh? There you go. All right, Mark 14, 1 and 2. After two days it was Pesach and the first and the feast of unleavened bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. Acts 12, 1 through 3. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Kepha, Peter also, now it was during the days of unleavened bread. And then 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8 again. Oh, no, this is different. Okay. Um, your, your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? 
Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. Okay, I did read this. For indeed, Messiah, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. There is a scripture on this and that I really wanted to read to everybody. Um, is it first or second Corinthians? Oh, here we go. Let me admit. Yeah, I can't believe I forgot this. I missed this. First Corinthians eleven. Add this to your to your scripture list. Verses twenty three through thirty four. Again, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23-34. For I received from the Adon that which I also delivered to you, that the Adon Yeshua, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now I know I read part of this, but there is more to read. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. Take eat, this is my body which is broken to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then verse 25, this cup is the renewed covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Here's where I want to add on. Verse 27 through 34. Therefore, listen carefully. Is it raining? Yes. yes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner would be guilty of the body and blood of the Adon. This why you don't bring non-believers or what I call a half-believer to Passover. This is why. Do not invite somebody to come check this out. They do not belong here for Passover. Not this piece. And I hope I ain't upsetting anybody or offending anybody. <laughs> Look, if somebody does not understand what Passover is, if they don't know, and they are not keeping all of the Word of God, they do not belong here. I cannot stress that enough. They don't belong at the Passover meal. They need to know what this is. Now, if they are just coming to know the Lord, and they want to know all the truth of God, and they want to be in obedience to Him, absolutely they belong here. So let me, in case anybody's wondering. Okay? Absolutely. But when, you know, I've got friends that are Christians and they want to, they'll tell me, we don't have to do that. Oh, but can we come and, and join you? No. I can tell them no. I got no problem. That's what I'm saying. Let me continue on verse 28. Let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink the cup. Look, if you have sin in your heart and you come to keep pertaining in the drinking of the cup and the breaking of the bread, you are going to be in trouble. Between now and then is a time for you to truly be in reflection and go to the Father and say, is there anything, Allah, is there any sin in my life that I need to repent of? Do I have animosity? Do I have anger? Do I have hate? Have I have forgiveness? Anything towards anybody, please show me so that I can repent of it. Please reveal it to me so I can ask you to re to remove it from me. Because, man, you see all the scripture verses. You see what Yah is saying about this. He holds this on a very high standard. And if you partake of it wrong, I, you just don't want to take that chance. Amen? Amen. Okay. Look at this. This is talking to the body, man. This is not talking to the lost. Verse 29 again. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Adon's body. Verse 30, listen. For this reason many are weak and sick among you and are asleep or dead. This is why. I'm going to tell you something. If the body of Messiah was doing its duty in its walk unto Yah, we would not have the same amount of sickness, death, cancer ridden, and everything else in the body as you do in the world. We would not have the same equality of divorces in the body as we do in the world. We would not have pastors being busted for sexual immorality. We would not have priests molesting children and all this other sick 
crap. If we were doing our job, if we were walking in Yahweh the way he called us to, we would be set apart. The world would be sick. The world would be dying. And we would be untouched like Israel was in Goshen. When all the plagues and everything were unleashed, it didn't touch them, but it touched everything around them. We would be untouched if we were coming before the king in the protocol. Yes. And we were coming before him clean. It's not, look, you've got to make mistakes. It's fine. We're going to do it. We're imperfect. But that's not an excuse to make those mistakes. Don't let that be an excuse. Don't let it be an excuse that, oh, uh, uh, I'm not having a good day anyways. Oh, I hate that excuse. Oh, my day was crap anyways. I'm going to do what I want. All right. Well, I want to stand there and listen to you tell y'all that one. Because I want to see you go uh, 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 stuttering the whole time. You ain't going to get one word out. We need to quit making excuses. Verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. How hard do you judge yourself? Do you judge yourself in a continual basis and say, Allah, what am I doing wrong? Are you seeing that things are not moving in your life? And instead of going, well, God, why aren't you answering me? Boo hoo, wah, wah. Why don't you go, Lord, what am I doing wrong now? What am I missing? What am I not asking for forgiveness on? What am I not moving on? What am I not doing when I come before you in prayer right? Allah, oh, show me. Convict me. Judge yourself. Are you reading stuff you should be? Are you looking at stuff? Judge your life. Because if you judge your life in the manner of Scripture, no one will ever be able to judge you. And it says that. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Adon that we may not be condemned with the world. Praise His mercy. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Listen, but if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. Like I said, this is not a feast to come fill your belly up with. Lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. When we come to Pesach, Eat something before you come. Don't come here thinking you're fixing to pig out on some lamb and, and be all excited. Because Michelle and I are just getting a little thing of lamb. Everybody's going to get a little piece of it. We are not filling up plates full of food. This is going to be, everybody's going to get a plate, and they're going to get a little bit of everything, and that's it. That's what we're doing. Exactly the way Scripture says to do. It's in remembrance. We will break bread. And we will have the drink to represent the body and the blood on the side. This is not a restaurant. Feast. Amen? Amen. Alright, last one. Bickering. Feast of first fruits. Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. I want you to, I want to present something here. First fruits. Do we give the first fruits of our life to Yah? This all ties in. The first fruits of this, I'm going to get into in a second, but I want to lead this off. We have a, a presentation of those first fruits right off the bat. Did anybody keep the feast before Moses came and gave it to us in the Torah? Yeah. That's not your question. I believe they did. Yeah. I, no question. I will give this first. Yeah, there's, there's, there's evidence in Scripture that before Moses, before Abraham, people were keeping the feast and keeping the commandments. And we had the first one with the first two sons of the Garden of Eden, Cain and Abel. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived him and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from Yahweh. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to Yahweh. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and Yahweh respected Abel and his offering. 
but he did not respect kings. Why? Why? Yes. It specifically says that Abel's was the firstborn of his flock. He gave Yah the first fruits of his flock. Because the Torah says that you will give me the firstborn of your flocks, of your herds, of your cattle, of your fields, and of your children. Now, we don't sacrifice the children to Yah. We dedicate them to him. But this is what was in Torah. Abel knew that. Cain knew it. All it says is Cain brought an offering of the, of the, of the harvest of his ground. But Yah rejected it. I, I have to say, because of the way it's described, Cain did not bring the first fruits of his garden to the Father. And that's why Yah rejected it. And this leads up to where we're going. Exodus 23, 19. Now there's not really much pertaining to the actual first fruits feast. There's like hardly anything in Scripture about it. But there's a lot of things that tie into it. And we're going to touch on a couple of them. Exodus 23, 19. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of Yahweh your elf. You shall not boil a young goat in, my, in your mother's mouth. Don't ask me why he says that. I ain't got the foggiest idea why he says that. And yeah. it is not because you don't mix, you can't have a cheeseburger. Right. No, it's the pagan nations were doing that in, in, um, is that what it was? in worship to their false gods. Yeah. Okay, I just, okay. Yeah. I forgot. And that's why God said, "Don't to do, don't come unto me the I way." I was they... racking my brain last night when I was finishing up this last one, and I was like, "Huh? What? <laughs> what, babe?" No, I just I I don't remember what I was saying. Now, I the pagan nations were doing it to their false gods, and so God right, says, so the "God says, don't." Orthodox practice that uh, you have to have two separate refrigerators, and one with your meat and one with your dairy. You can't mix two. What, dude? You keep interrupting me. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all you kept. You did it twice. I'm like, what are you talking okay, about? I didn't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> My mind's back there going. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> and I'm scratching my head going, what did I do wrong? <laughs> all right. What she said. Yes, sir. Um, there was um, one of our, our old pastor, our pastor, said that the first meeting of it was like, you don't want to. Because when you have to build the spirit back to the child, so you don't want to kill the child, you have to fight. That's not cool. I like that. As long as you tell me I can't have a cheeseburger. As long as you don't tell me I can't have a cheeseburger. <laughs> right. But that, I like. I like that. We couldn't hear him back here. What did he say? Go ahead. Say it louder. It's when, because the milk is used to give the child life. So you don't want to kill the child with blood. Oh, that's okay. cool. Yeah. yeah. I like I that. Think that's pretty good. Yeah. I like that. Better than what I have, which is nothing. Which is nothing. All right. Uh, Exodus 34, 26. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring to the house of Yahweh your Elohim. You shall not, again, boil the goat and all that stuff. All right, so here's my question to you. It's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer this. Do you give the first fruits of whatever you do to Yah? Or does he get second or last? Now, you can call it tithe, you can call it offering, you can call it whatever you want. When you get a paycheck, do you give the first fruits of that check to the Father before you do anything else? Do you honor Yah with the first fruits? Do you dedicate the first fruits of your loins to, your, to Yah? Are you doing that? Whatever it is. Your house, your family, the beginning of the year. One way that you can give the first fruits of the year. Today's the first day of, of, of a beat. You can fast or you can do something to give God the first fruits of the year unto Him before anything of yourself, your family, or anything else. Does that make sense? 
giving Yah. Yah requires the first fruits. It is a commandment. It's not a suggestion. We are to give him the first fruits. We need to figure out what that is. Leviticus 23, 9 through 14 has the best explanation for the first fruits. 20, uh, 23, 9 through 14, Leviticus. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheep before Yahweh to be accepted on your behalf on the day after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. You shall offer on that day when you weigh the sheep a male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to Yahweh. Its grain offering shall be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed oil and offering made by fire to Yahweh for a sweet aroma. Its drink offering shall be of wine, one fourth of a hen. You shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you, uh, you have brought an offering to your elk. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Now, we're going to come back to this because there's a specific understanding of that high priest and the wave offering. All right? Uh, Numbers 18. 8 through 13. Man, I'm burning up in here. And Yahweh spoke to Aaron, Here I, here I myself have also given you charge of my heave offerings, all the holy gifts of the children of Israel, I have given them as a portion to you and your sons as an ordinance forever. This shall be yours of the most holy things reserved from the fire, every offering on, of theirs, every grain offering, and every sin offering, and every trespass offering, which they render to me, shall be most holy for you and your sons. In a most holy place you shall eat it. Every male shall eat it, and eat it, it shall be holy to you. This also is yours, the heave offering of their gift with all the wave offerings of the children of Israel. I have given them to you and your sons and daughters with you as an ordinance forever. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat it. All the best of the oil, all the best of the new wine and the grain first fruits which they offer Yahweh, I have given them to you. Whatever first ripe fruit is in their land which they bring to Yahweh shall be yours. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat it. This, these offerings are the first fruits. These first fruits that are commanded to be given unto Yahweh's house, they went to the Levitical priests. I'm not a Levitical priest, so don't be bringing me your first fruits. I don't. Unless it's like really good mangoes. I'll take that. Actually, my wife will take them away from me. Right? <laughs> All right. Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 11, I think is the same thing. Let me look real quick. Uh, offer it first fruits, offerings, and tithes. Uh, 1 through 11. And it shall be when you come into the land which Yahweh Elohim is giving you as an inheritance, you possess it, dwell in it. That you shall take some of the first of all the produce of the ground which you shall bring from your land that, that Yahweh your El is giving you, put it in a basket, go to the place where Yahweh your El chooses to make his name abide. And you shall go to the one who is priest in those days and say to him, I declare today to Yahweh our Elohim that I have come to the country which Yahweh swore to our forefathers to give us, obviously Jerusalem, Israel. Uh, then the priest shall take the basket out of your hand and set it down before the altar of Yahweh our Elohim. And you shall answer and say before Yahweh your El, My father was a Syrian. Who's that? Who's paying attention? Who is that? There is Abraham. He was a Chaldean. He was a Babylon. Uh, he left the Paris and he went down to Egypt, dwelt there. Few in number, and there he became a nation great, mighty, and populous. But the Egyptians mistreated us, afflicted us, laid hard bondage on us. Then we cried out to Yahweh our Elohim of our fathers. And Yahweh heard our voice, looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. So Yah brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm with great terror and with signs and wonders. He has brought us to this place and has given us the land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land with you, which you, O Yah, have given me. Then you shall set it before Yahweh our Elohim, worship before Yahweh your El. 
So you shall rejoice in every good thing which Yahweh your El has given to you in your house and to the Levite and the stranger who is among you. Proverbs 3. If you want to grow in wisdom, study the book of Proverbs. You will grow in wisdom. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor Yahweh with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Are you hurting financially? Are you struggling in things? Then you need to ask Yah if there is anything that is in your increase that you are not giving Him the first fruits of. I'm serious as a heart attack. Do you get money from a family member because it's your birthday? Uh, do you get something from somebody because of whatever else? Do you give Yah the first fruits of it or do you just keep it and put it in your pocket? Are you saying we have to tie birthday money? It's not a tithe, it's an offering. It is offering Yah the first fruits of your increase. When you were given, a, if you were, hey Brianna, if you were given $100 for your birthday, did you just get increase? Yeah. Okay. It's that simple. A lot of times we hurt financially because we're missing something and giving you the first fruits. Yeah. You want your finances blessed? Look, Yah says in Malachi chapter 3, all by itself, He says, if you will bring your offerings to my house, I will open up the window of heaven that will pour out blessing on you where you will not have enough room. Now, in the church, especially mega churches, it's like, woohoo, I'm going to get that Cadillac. That's not what it's talking about. That blessing of overflowing to where there's no room, you will have an amazing relationship with your families. You will have an amazing marriage. You will have a good job. You will pay all your bills. You will have food on your table. You will be in good health. Amen. And all of these things, those are blessings of Yah. Yes. Not giving you a house to park a bunch of cars in that you ain't going to use or have a $10 million mansion that you and three other people are living in that you can fit 50 families in. That's not a blessing. That is you being greedy and taking His Word and twisting it to fit your agenda. Yah will open up that window, but He's going to open up that window on those who are faithful unto Him. Who want that blessing the way He wants to give it to you, not the way you or what you want from Him. Amen? Amen. John 20, verse 7. What? <laughs> yeah. We can't yeah. hear it. We can't hear him. It's a it's a job oh. from yeah, these these pastors that they have to have a plane so they don't have to ride with everybody else because they need to get to their destination faster to preach the word. They don't want to have to ride with the heathens. Yeah. It's like whatever, right? Alright. John 20 verse 7. Now, check this out. And the handkerchief that had been ground, uh, hang on, had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. All right, first fruits is the resurrection of Yeshua. He is the first fruit of the resurrection. Okay, that's what Resurrection Sunday, as some call it, is. Did he resurrect Sunday morning? Come on, we got enough veterans in here. Y'all know. Does he, did he resurrect Sunday morning? No. He did not. He resurrected right after Shabbat. Saturday night. Scripture teaches us that. It says that at the breaking of dawn, it was empty. He was already gone. But here, a handkerchief that was wrapped around his head, 
It was folded up nice and neat and set apart from the rest of the linen wrapped around his body. Do you know why? Except Tom. I know Tom knows why. Okay, Brenda knows why. Kimmy knows why. I know you two should know why. Anybody else who's new into this? Do you know why? You've only been into this a couple of years. Do you know why? Gary, do you know? Go ahead. No, but you're close. You are close. All right. Gary was saying it's a reference to fold up the napkin at the Last Supper. That's not, that's not it. But it's close. Here's tradition. All right? And this is what the sign was in this. When a master is at the table eating, the servant will stand off from the table and watch his master eat. And when the master gets up from the table, he'll do one of two things. He will fall up the napkin and throw it on top of the plate and walk away. The servant will know that the master is done to go and clear the table. But if the master folds up the napkin and sets it next to the plate and walks away, the servant won't touch it because he's coming back. <laughs> oh, so Yeshua told us, man, before he walked out of that tomb, he took that thing off and he folded it up and he laid it there separated from the linen clothes to let everybody know, I'll be right back. Man. Woo! Goosebumps, boy! Did he? You're right, he did. You're right, you were right, Gary was right, my bad. Get it right. <laughs> Throw something at me next time. No, Gary was right. No, you were right, brother. You had it right. Yeah, he did. And I just read that, too. I'm tired. I'm sorry. I have some excuse. I'll find it. All right. John 20, verses 11 through 18. But Mary stood outside. Now listen, listen. This is going to reflect Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23 says that the, they brought the first fruit of the sheep offering. And the, and the priest went and waved it as an acceptable offering before the Father. Okay? Remember that? Yes? Y'all are sitting there going, hmm. All right, we're almost done. We're almost done. Come on, find some. Hmm, find it. Let's go. But Mary stood outside by the tomb, weeping, and she wept as she stood, stooped down, looked into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting, one at the hand and the other at the feet, head, uh, where the body of Yeshua had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Adon, and I do not know where he, they had laid him. Now when she had said this, she had been paying attention, she had saw the folded up napkin. She'd be like, oh, it's going to be right back. Of course, not in there. Um, uh, now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Yeshua standing there and did not know that it was Yeshua. Yeshua said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Yeshua said to her, Mary. Oh. He didn't say woman. He didn't say nothing else. He said her name. Because he knows her name. Yahweh knows our name. He says, I will remember you because I know your name. He told Moshe in that teaching last week where I said what he said to Moshe, he says, Moshe, you have found favor in my eyes because I know you and I know your name. And he said to her, Mary. That's all he had to say. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Yeshua said to her, do not touch me, is what it actually says in the original script. Not cling to me, because that's, that's to me, she's grabbing on him. It says in the actual text, it says, Do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my Yah and your Yah. Now, how does that pertain to Leviticus 23? Because he 
And why can Yeshua present himself as the first fruits? Yes. Only the high priest could present the wave offering of the first fruits before the Father is an acceptable offering. So Yeshua said, Don't touch me. I have not presented myself to the Father. Don't tell them I'm coming. So while she's running to tell him he's coming, he goes before the Father because he is now the final high priest, presents himself as the wave offering of the first fruits of the resurrection, of the first fruits of the children of Yah. And then he goes back and presents himself unto the twelve and unto over 500 eyewitnesses of his resurrection. Yes. Hallelujah. All right. Acts 26. I love that. When I first learned that, man, that just about knocked me out of my seat. It was awesome. 22 and 23. Therefore, having obtained help from Yah to this day, I stand witness both to small and great, saying to, uh, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Messiah would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim life to the Jewish people and to the going Gentiles. 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, 20 through 28. But now Messiah is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Messiah all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Messiah, the first fruits, afterward those who are Messiahs at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to Yah the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all um, enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is expected. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. James 1.18 Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a king, okay, I'm sorry, a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And in Revelation 14, 1 through 5. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpers playing their harps. They sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to Yah and to the Lamb. You know what? This is the first time I've ever thought about it, and I have no idea if I'm right. There, for years, for years, and for years, everybody's trying to figure out who the 144,000 are. And we know that they are 12,000 from each tribe of the 12 tribes of Israel. But it says that these are the first fruits. My oh, goodness, I never put this together before. When Yeshua rose from the dead, anybody know where I'm going with this? Huh. All those people who rose it with him? said that many rose with him and went into the city. Something to study out. Well, let me read that again. Revelation 14, that verse. I'm like all... Uh, I know, right? Kind of the day. <laughs> These were redeemed from among men, 
be first fruits to Yah and to the Lamb. Would you, if Yeshua was the first fruits of the resurrection, wouldn't that mean that those who rose with him were part of the first fruits? How are they undefiled by women? They did. It says that they were virgins. <clears throat> So, people who died virgins before? Apparently. Huh. They were redeemed among men. I don't know. I just want to know. It's something curious. to study out. I've never, sure. I've never had that hit me before. It's worth the study. David. So, I believe it's in Matthew. I'm not really sure. But I remember before he went back, he went to the city. And I, I believe it was uh, he went to grab those people. Oh, yeah, that's in, um, I think that's in Acts or Romans where it says that he went and freed some to those in the prison. Yeah, so do you, reference to Hades. But it doesn't say they rose. Now, it could be that if he went to, that, to Hades to preach to those, because it says that Yeshua was in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights, which is where Hades dwells. Well, that's, that, who else okay. would they be, Paul? Who else would? Uh, of course so, not. That's it. Maybe. Honey, it has to be those that he preached to. Why else would they rise? I've always believed that the people that he preached to and how are the I ones just... who came up. All right. I well, mean, who else are they going to be? Why would they rise with him? I don't know. Yes, it makes sense. Those who chose to believe. I mean, I, I don't know. If you're down there, you'd think that anybody would want to get out of there. You think so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Pharaoh was, he was screwed. He wasn't going nowhere. He already had his chance. Um, okay, so conclusion of this, our Passover lamb, we keep this in remembrance of the Passover lamb, the, what became the presentation of the Exodus to the, the, the Yah leaving his throne and coming and becoming that Passover lamb. We have the unleavened bread to the removal of the sin, to take away the old man, to bring in the new, to remove all of that leaven, every drop, so that we can fully receive the newness of what it is to be that unleavened bread unto Yahweh our Elohim. And then the first fruits of our Messiah is the promise and the hope that we have that when He comes at His second coming, that we will rise up and be with our Messiah and our King for all eternity. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.